Today, class, we're going to talk about something called factoring cubic equations. You may encounter this on your high set test. To begin with, let's talk about the objective of this lesson. We should be able to, by the end of this, to solve cubic equations through the use of factoring or substitution. If you were not giving answer choices, your only choice to solve this would be factoring. But since we have a list of answer choices, which is how the high set is structured, we can also use substitution. An example of the type of problems you could see on the test is right here. Here's an example of that. This is our goal at the end of the lesson, is to be able to factor this. Here's some vocabulary term that you need to keep in the back of your mind as we go through this. Imaginary numbers, factoring, cubic equation, and roots. I'm not going to give you a blurb about these right now. These are kind of concepts and vocabulary that's better shown than explained. So just kind of keep those in the back of your mind as we go through this. Here are some foundational skills you should already have before you tackle this problem. Division of exponents, ability to factor basic equations, basics of imaginary numbers, and knowledge of square roots. Again, these, kind, these skills are better shown than explained, so let me show them to you. First thing is division of exponents. If you happen to have the same base, which is the same variable, so in this case, v and v, and you have them on top of each other in a division type relationship, you can subtract those exponents. So for example, we have v to the tenth and v to the fourth. We can say 10 minus 4 gives us 6. We leave the v by itself and then we add a 6 to it. Same thing here, we, both, we have g on top and bottom, which tells us we can divide. So 15 minus 10 gives us 5. 8 minus 6, 2. 4 minus 3, 1. Again, notice that the variables are the same on top and bottom. If they aren't, you cannot do the subtraction. Something else you should already understand is how to factor a simple number. Like for example, if you're going to factor the simple number 8, all that is saying is what two numbers can you multiply to get an 8? 1 times 8 is 8, 2 times 4 is 8. Something a lot of students will forget about is the fact that there's a negative aspect to this. Not only is positive 1 and positive 8 multiply to be 8, but also negative 1 and negative 8 will multiply to be 8. On that same token, 2 and 4 could also be negative. Because remember, two negatives can multiply to be a positive. So here are four sets of factors for just the positive number 8. So here's just another quick example of that. If we have the number 6, 2 times 3 is 6, or the negative equivalent, which would be negative 2 and negative 3, or 1 times 6 is 6, or again, the negative equivalent, negative 1 and negative 6. Now, a square root, what does a square root ask? A lot of students don't understand that. A square root is asking what number times itself will give you what's underneath it. So for example, what number times itself could give you 16? That would be 4 times 4. Now, just like with the factoring, so when we looked at the 8, we had 2 times 4 was 8, but we also had the negative equivalent because negative times negative gives you positive. It's almost like you're factoring this 16 to solve it. You're asking yourself what number times itself would give me 16, 4 times 4. But just like with this 8, we can't forget about the negatives. Because the only thing the square root is asking is what number times itself. It just so happens that negative 4 times itself also gives us 16. So there are two possible answers to the square root of 16. 4 and negative 4. And most of you should understand that 4 is an answer, but we need to start understanding that also negative 4 could be an answer. Now last but not least, you just have to understand what a cubic equation looks like and kind of what that means to the problem. A cubic equation has the highest power of 3. So for example, like the one we looked at earlier, Powers are these little exponents. This one doesn't have one, which is understood to be a 1, a 2, and a 3. So you say, well, which one's the largest? In this case, it is 3. That makes this one a cubic equation. But what's more important to this problem at hand is you should understand that since that highest power is 3, there's a possibility of three solutions. So even if the problem only gives you two solutions to work with, you should understand there are actually three. And again, this will make more sense once we actually get into an actual problem, what I'm trying to tell you here. Again, these things are better shown than explained in most cases. Now, when you're solving an equation, 
the first step is you should factor it if possible. Now, when we're looking at cubic equation, that's different than a quadratic. If you remember, a quadratic has the highest power of 2, and there is a way to factor it. There's a special way. Just like with quadratic equations, there's also a special way to factor cubic equations. First step is you section off the first two terms and the last two terms. I just use a vocabulary term called term. In our minds, that should be anything you add or subtract. So in this case, there are four terms. We section off the first two together and the last two together. And then here you apply your factoring knowledge you should already have at hand. When factoring a variable, you look at the exponents. So if we look at just this parentheses right here, we're going to say, OK, we have a cube and a squared. You say, well, which one's the smallest? In this case, the smallest is the x squared. So that is what you're going to pull out of that. By pull out, I mean write it on the outside of the parentheses. Now, what do we do with the inside? You take each term on the inside and you divide it by what you pulled out. Again, how did I decide what I pulled out? I picked the smallest one. And in this case, that would be the x squared, not the x cubed. When you pull the x squared out, that means you're going to divide everything on the inside by x squared. So, for example, x third divided by x squared. Remember, our prior knowledge tells us we should subtract those exponents. So 3 minus 2 gives us 1. So now we have x to the first power. Something else you should already know also is when you divide the same thing on top and bottom, that cancels out to become just a 1. So now we have x to the first plus 1 on the inside of the parentheses. Now, like with most situations where we have a 1, this one is not important, so I can just erase it. And now I'm left with x squared parentheses x plus 1. This is factoring the first set of parentheses. The second thing you should do, you should factor the second set of parentheses. So it kind of looks like it's two separate problems in one. Now, there's an x here, and there's not an x there. Remember how I said you pull out the smallest variable? Well, the smallest variable in this problem is nothing. So what do I pull out in terms of variables? Nothing. But looking at the numbers, we have to decide what is the biggest number I can pull out of both 9 and 9. That comes down to your factoring that we already talked about. You have to think about, OK, what numbers can I pull out of 9? I can pull out a 3 or 9 based on my factoring tree. So we just try to decide the biggest number. Well, they're both 9, so they'll have the same factors. And the biggest number that we can pull out of it or multiply to get it would be 9. So out of both of these, I'm going to pull out a 9. Now, just like with the variables, when you pull something out, you have to divide everything on the inside by what you pulled out. So I pulled out a 9, so I'm going to divide 9x and 9 by the 9 that I pulled out. 9 divided by 9, cancel out, and you're left with just x. And then again, like we said over here, if you have the same thing on top and bottom, that becomes a 1. So over here, I end up with x squared, parentheses, x plus 1. Over here, I end up with 9, parentheses, x plus 1. So if what I explained before doesn't make a whole lot of sense, here's a simpler way or a different way of looking at it. We looked at the first set of parentheses we created, which would have been x cubed plus x squared. Now, if you're going to use this, this chart that I'm showing you, you have to think about it, oh, there's a number side and a variable side to each expression. Well, in this case, the number side is going to be 1 here and 1 there. Because if you remember, if you have a variable by itself, there's a 1 in front of it. So there's a 1 here and there's a 1 there. So you can take both these numbers and put them on the number side of this chart. On the other side, we have the variables, which are just the variables with their exponents. So over here, we have x cubed and x squared. So you're taking this first thing, you're breaking it apart, and you're taking the second term, and you're breaking it apart also. Now the factoring. You say, OK, looking at the number side, you're going to pull out the biggest number you can out of each. So we have 1 and 1. What's the biggest number we can pull out of 1 and 1? Just 1. But what that boils down to is dividing both of these by 1. 
Well, if we divide both of those by 1, nothing happens because anything divided by 1 is just itself. So really, there's not any factoring we have to do on this side. Looking over here, we have x cubed and x squared. While we pulled out the biggest over here, we pull out the smallest over here. What that means is you look at the x cubed and x squared and say, well, which one's smaller? x squared. Well, that's what you're going to pull out. So just like before, we divide both sides by x squared. Since we're pulling out an x squared, it goes on the outside. Division of exponents, you subtract, 3 minus 2 is 1. The 1 is understood to be there, get rid of it. Those two go away to become just a 1. Now our second set of parentheses looked like this. Again, if you want to use this chart, you can. Take both the numbers, put them on the number side. Take both the variables, put them on the variable side. Over here, there isn't a variable, so I'll leave this spot blank. You look at both the numbers and again say, what's the biggest number I can pull out of both of them? Well, again, you have to use your factor tree. The biggest number you can pull out is a 9. So out of both of these, I can pull out a 9. Because you're looking for the biggest number over here. And just like we already explained, if you're going to pull something out, you have to divide everything by what you pulled out. So I pulled out a 9, so I'm going to divide both of these by 9, and I end up with x plus 1, just as I did before. Over here, the smallest variable is nothing. So what I pull out on the variable side? Nothing. Now again, this is just a different way of looking at what we've already done, an organizational way. If the other way makes sense to you, don't worry about this. If this makes sense to you, use this. But you're looking for the biggest number you can pull out and the smallest variable. Now, once we pull both of those out, again, we started with this and it became this. We also had this. And it became that with our factoring. Well, if we put it all back together, this is what it now looks like. We take the first part and put it in front, last part put it in back. The fact that these two are exactly the same is important to note. That's kind of your check and balance. If both of those look exactly the same, that means you're on the right track. So kind of keep that in mind as you're doing this problem. Let me ask you a quick question. If you have a problem, you're supposed to solve it but there's not a number over here past the equal sign. How do you go about solving it? Well, the answer is it always has to be equal to zero if it doesn't already tell you what it's equal to. So in this case, it doesn't tell us. So I'm going to replace that y with a zero. Now, if there was a number there, this is important to note. If there is a number there, don't change it to zero. Just if there's a variable all by itself and it doesn't already have a number there, that's when you change it to zero. Keep that in mind. So let's just do a quick recap of what we've done so far because a lot has happened. We started with this. We grouped them together. We pulled out the common factor of each. If this part is still a little fuzzy to you, rewind the video if you need to and watch it again. But once we pull both those out, this is what we ended up with. Then this is the factoring. So we factored it so far. And then I told you that if you're solving it, because it's important to note that some problems will tell you to factor, some problems will tell you to solve. If they told you to factor it, your next step is right here. You take what they have in common leave it by itself so that x plus 1 kind of combines together to become one parentheses. You take both the factors you pulled out and then you put those two together just like that. So you take what they have in common, put it together, take the two things you factored out and put those together. So if the problem told you just to factor, pay attention to the wording, that's your answer. You just successfully factored that. That could be a possible answer.